Okay, let's get started here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Nelson, and I'm Dean of the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts here at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. I'm delighted to participate in today's program with Roderick Fredrickson, Ferguson, excuse me, William Robertson, co-professor of women's, women's gender and sexuality studies and gender studies at Yale University. Today's program is in recognition of World AIDS Day, which falls this Friday, December 1st, 2023. Droderick's title is The Bookshop of Black Queer Diaspora on the Contents of F Rotimi Fanny Coyote's Trunk. The talk will explore the work of the Nigerian-born British photographer Rotimi Fanny Coyote, who lived from 1980, 1955 to 1989. After Roderick's lecture, he and I will have a brief discussion, and then we will take questions from the attendees. I would like to thank Courtney Martin, Jane Noah Sadko, and Linda Payne for making today's program possible. A couple of housekeeping notes before Roderick begins. Please note that this program is being recorded. Your camera and sound are muted and will remain so throughout the program. We will be using the Q&A feature located on your navigation bar to gather your questions, and they will be answered at the end of the program, or as many as we can get to. Um, but feel free to submit your questions at any time. If you would like closed captioning, a live, live transcript is available by clicking on the icon on your navigation bar. Though we are virtual, it is important to note that Yale University acknowledges that indigenous people and nations, including Mohegan, Niantic, Golden, Golden Hill, Pagusset, Eastern Pequot, Mashantucket Pequot, Quinnipiac, Chattacoque, and other Algonquin-speaking people have stewarded the land and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples, these nations, and this land. And so without further ado, I'm going to ask Roderick to take the virtual lectern and thank you all for being here. All right, my thanks to Courtney Martin uh, for this invitation, to Jane Nawatsako and for, to Linda Payne for facilitating this presentation. My deep gratitude to Stephen Nelson for agreeing to be in conversation. All right, let me begin by explaining the context out of which this paper comes, which will help clarify the form that the paper takes. It's part of a book project entitled The Bookshop of Black Queer Diaspora. In terms of subject matter, the book looks at Black queer art and activism in North America and the UK to assess the rise of neoliberal formations in those regions and the challenges to those formations. But the story is told through a series of visits to an imaginary Black queer bookshop, one that contains various artifacts, books, paintings, maps, albums, sculptures, masks, tapestries, posters, and a trunk. The British Nigerian queer artist Rotemi Fanny Coyote's photographs are well known for how they overlay Yoruba and Christian iconographies with homoerotic depictions of Black men. Archived at Autograph ABP, the Black Photography and Film Center in East London, the photographs were actually part of the contents of a trunk that Fanny Coyote's partner, Alex Hurst, donated to autograph after Fanny Coyote's death. In this talk, I explore the trunk as a symbol of Black migration to the UK and how the movement of Black diasporic populations to the British metropole became the site for observing the workings of sexuality, race, empire, and diaspora. The talk also addresses the trunk and its contents as entities that defy any singular national belonging, a fact that makes the trunk meaningful for any discussion of the Black queer diasporic communities that were emerging in the UK and the US during the 1980s, meaningful as an account of a Black subject's displacement from home, significant as evidence of arts capacity to reconcile marginalized subjects with the fact of racial displacement and important as the final effects of a queer subject who became one of the many casualties of the HIV AIDS epidemic. 
The art historian Stephen Nelson has argued, quote, Fanny Coyote's photographs position the body as avatar of intrinsically modern experiences of social, cultural, sexual, and metaphoric fragmentation, end quote. In this way, the trunk incarnates this historical and corporeal fragmentation and symbolizes an attempt to determine the requirements of Black queer diasporic life as it was being invented, turning the trunk into an artifact that might tell us how to meet those requirements and make our homes even in the context of social death. The trunk sits up against a wall in the eastern part of the bookshop. The lid is open. The inside of the lid itself has been painted black, giving the impression that the trunk is old beyond its years, an aged patina on wood that is still creamy and white. Inside the trunk are a series of black and white photographs depicting mostly young black men there are two pictures of a model with his arms crossed, looking directly at the camera. You are told that he was one of Fanny Coyote's favorite models and that his name is Razor. There is another photo of a young black man whose head is leaning on the arm of another black man. There is a photo of another young black man with albinism in the box, his chest, neck, shoulders, and part of his face filling up much of the photograph's space. The photos mark the trunk as the evidence of Fanny Coyote's interest in the Black male form, both as an artist and as a queer man. Discussing this interest, he said in 1988, Quote, it has been my destiny to end up as an artist with a sexual taste for other young men. As a result of this, a certain distance has necessarily developed between myself and my origins. The distance is even greater as a result of my having left Africa as a refugee over 20 years ago, end quote. Fanny Coyote was born in Nigeria to a prominent Yoruba family at the age of to a prominent Yoruba family. At the age of 12, he and his family would flee to Britain because of the outbreak of the Nigerian Civil War, a war that was, to a degree, the result of the Igbos in the southeastern region of the country voting in 1967 to declare an independent Igbo state called the Republic of Biafra. Ideologically, the secession of the Southeastern Territory and the establishment of Biafra were motivated by the discourse of national self-determination. The proclamation of Biafra in 1967 stated, for example, quote, the desire on the part of the minority groups for self-determination is the active force behind the demand for the creation of more states, end quote. The proclamation went on to locate Biafran independence in the, hero, quote, heroic struggles of all peoples all over the world for their national freedom, end quote. The Nigerian state's response would be protracted and brutal. For two and a half years, Nigeria's federal military government would wage a war backed by the British and the Soviet Union on the breakaway republic. The opposing forces would produce a blockade that would result in the deaths of over 1 million people through fighting and planned starvation. For many, this would be the end of the post-colonial dream. Sitting there in the bookshop, the trunk bears witness to that distance between Fanny Coyote's history as a young refugee and his life as a developing black queer artist in the UK. You think to yourself how the trunk carries the symbolic and discursive weight associated with suitcases. Discussing that weight, the visual cultural scholar, Irit Rogoff writes, quote, the suitcase signifies the moment of rupture, the instance in which the subject is torn 
out of a web of connectedness that contained him or her through an invisible net of belonging, end quote. Read as a sign of the ruptures produced by the Nigerian civil war, the trunk expresses the violence of war and migration. The aged look of the trunk acknowledge, acknowledges a history that is distant, traumatic, and inscribed on bodies still in their prime. It is a look that imprints Black queer communities with post-colonial failures. There is a rumor that Fanny Coyote and Hearst use the trunk as a coffee table. In this way, the trunk represents an attempt to create a queer life from scratch, perhaps without the benefits of African models who could show Fanny Coyote how to combine elements that were no doubt presented as irreconcilable, how blackness might consort with homosexuality and yield non-normative forms of community. As the art historian W.E.N. Borland argues, quote, Fanny Coyote gave visibility to a range of publics otherwise excluded from art making in general and who more typically appeared on the picture plane as objects of ethnographic knowledge, scopic pleasure, or coarse stereotype. The imagined community of Black queer diaspora in the 70s and 80s emerged when certain cultural presumptions lost their axiomatic grip. The first of these was the idea that the nation state form could provide sufficient accommodations for the heterogeneous groups within a society. The Nigerian civil war for many put that notion to rest. The second was that national liberation would automatically produce political and ideological alternatives to bourgeois and Western state nationalism. As Cornel West famously argued in his essay, The New Cultural Politics of Difference, quote, one crucial lesson of the decolonization process remains the manner in which most third world authoritarian bureaucratic elites deploy essentialist rhetoric, rhetorics about, quote, homogeneous national cultures and, quote, positive images, quote, in order to repress and regiment their diverse and heterogeneous populations, end quote. The third was that heteropatriarchy is the natural and indigenous order for any functioning non-Western society. M. Jackie Alexander, Gayatri Gopanath, Chandra Mohanty, and others have written about the ways in which heteropatriarchy was naturalized through colonial laws and then sustained through post-colonial legislative maneuvers. As a coffee table, the trunk would have stood for an emphatic and informed no to the presumption of the nation state form as it was adopted by post-colonial states. You look at the trunks patina once again and ruminate on the fact that trunks are not only part of the history of migration, but commerce as well. How they were staples of the 17th century world, a world that the 18th century British philosopher, economist and historian, David Hume described as, quote, a universal fermentation in which navigation had extended itself over the whole globe. End quote. Examining how Hume was steeped in the 18th century commercial scene of the Atlantic, historian Emma Rothschild argues, quote, Hume was thought of in his lifetime and for much of the 19th century as the first great theorist of long distance commerce or of what one of his biographers described in 1846 as the social economy of the globe, end quote. This was an 18th century economy denoted by the global commerce in goods, land, and people. Indeed, as the political theorist Onur Ulas Incha argues, colonial plantation and slavery presented Hume with the stinging conundrum created as it did, quote, a powerful engine of global commerce 
and an uncivil institution that contravene the conventions of modern European civility, end quote. Because of this conundrum, that was in fact a founding contradiction, the same processes that had produced modern Western notions of civility would also engender the conditions for exploitation and inhumanity. As Incha explains, quote, imperial frontiers comprised a great testing ground for the operation of commerce outside the restrictive institutions, customs and norms regnant in Britain, wherein economic entrepreneurs found unprecedented freedom in devising novel and violent forms of extraction and exploitation, end quote. This arrangement between modern civility and modern deviation would make its way to late 19th century British colonialism as well. In fact, you can see it specifically in the 1886 Royal Charter granted to the National African Company, later called the Royal Niger Company, the charter that began the colonial seizure of Nigeria and other lands Straining to present colonialism as a civilizing and respectful venture, the charter states, quote, in the administration of justice by the company to the peoples of its territories or to any of the inhabitants thereof, careful regard shall always be had to the customs and laws of the class or tribe or nation to which the parties respectively belong, especially with respect to the holding, possession, transfer and disposition of lands and goods and testate or intestate succession thereto and marriage, divorce and legitimacy and other rights of property and personal rights." End quote. The civilized tone of the charter notwithstanding, the colonial record in Nigeria is replete with abuses. From the start of the charter, in 1886 to 1890, the Royal Niger Constabulary conducted over 100 military expeditions in the southern parts of Nigeria, forcing leaders there to pin their names to treaties. Seizing control of oil in 1891, the British established the Oil Coast Protectorate, which would later be renamed the Niger Coast Protectorate. In the room where the trunk lies, there is a curious self-portrait of a naked Fanny Coyote holding a white parasol, striking a pose that is very much reminiscent of the colonial lady. On further inquiry, you are told two things, that the photo came with the trunk and that one of Fanny Coyote's favorite films was the American Disney mus musical, Mary Poppins. It's been some years since you've seen the movie, but you recall it depicts a moment in the Victorian era, a moment in which patriarchal authority is challenged by social transformations on the horizon, transformations symbolized literally by the magical and iconoclastic nanny who, using her umbrella, glides in on the winds of change. You learn also that, as an accessory, the umbrella's associations with feminine civility characterize only part of its history. It was also linked to iconoclasm. In point of fact, the Italian futurist Mino del Cite designed a parasol and said this, quote, as an accessory for sporty women, it exalts the speed and beauty of airplanes, the motor car and the motorboat in an exhilarating race, end quote. The parasol in the photo seems to adhere more to this description as an accessory for a naked, black, queer, immigrant artist. It gestures towards the upsetting of bourgeois discourses and norms, a disruption carried out by Fanny Coyote and the diverse communities that he represented as they made a vehicle of the wind. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Roderick. This is a this is a beautiful, beautiful paper, and Thank um, you. and there's a lot. There's a lot <laughs> happening here, and so let's talk. Right? Um, I think that you know that trunk. It, it, it is such. It's doing a lot of work. Mm -hmm. All right, in in your in your narrative, and it you know it feels like it's a repository not just of Fanny Coyote and arguably Hearst's existence, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but right. you frame it as a a repository of a larger world of traumatic histories, you know, re residue of the slave trade, all of these different things, and it feels like it it has a bit of a it's working at op, at op, to opposite ends. Mm -hmm. And so on the one hand, it's a sign of homelessness mm -hmm. and displacement. On mm -hmm. the other hand, it's a might have been a coffee table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so right. it's kind of like it's it's homemaking as well. Right. And, right. and and I would love to hear you sort of think aloud about that dichotomy and thinking yeah. about that within the the context of of the artist. And yeah. how he, you know, and his his own sort of his own sort of dialogue about distance from you know from his home, from his you know, birth home, and from his distance in other ways. Yeah, no, that's such an excellent question, Stephen. Um, you know, I'm someone who's always interested in, in contradictions, right? Mm. And so the trunk for me, you know, embodies a set of contradictions. You know, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. it's about displacement, but it's also about making a home. You know, it's mm -hmm. about um, memories and mm -hmm. it's also about trauma. It's about good times, you know, as mm -hmm. well as, uh, you know, this violence of migration and also the violence of war. Right. 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 And uh, it is also... You know, I was telling you um, um, before the talk that the trunk was brought to autograph um, right. Black Photography right. Archive by Alex Hurst, right? Fanny Coyote's mm -hmm. partner. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's also a very loving gesture. Yes, you know, yes. You know, yes. that a partner yeah. would do for, mm -hmm. you know, a deceased intimate, right? right. Right. You know, sort of taking it to this uh, Black photography archive and mm -hmm. essentially saying to the curators there, please hold this, please take care of this. You know, right. mm -hmm. it is a precious item right. You right. Know, to me. So I've always been interested in, mm -hmm. um, you know, contradictions, but in mm -hmm. relation to this particular object, it's, you know, the mm -hmm. sort of contradictions that would adhere to anybody who's been displaced. Right. You know, right. or anybody right. who has suffered a loss, whether through war mm -hmm. or through HIV AIDS, mm. that, you know, the thing that you want, if you're the survivor, you know, you want your loved one's memory to be honored. You yes. Know, you want their artifacts to be, you know, mm -hmm. preserved. Right. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. there's a way in which I want mm -hmm. the trunk to you know, be energized by all mm -hmm. of those things, mm -hmm. you know, and also to kind of evoke all the associations that one would associate with a life, you right. know, Frank right. Coyote was, right. he was an artist, he was a Black British photographer, mm -hmm. he was a mm -hmm. uh, Nigerian photographer, he was also mm -hmm. a refugee. Right, know? right, right. Um, You know, so I want that trunk to mm -hmm. invoke those elements. I also mm -hmm. wanted to invoke um, the irony of you going to mm -hmm. the place, mm -hmm. you know, that occasions in many ways your disruption in the first yes. place. You know? Yeah, yeah. Now that's super interesting, but also, you know, the the idea of finding that trunk at autograph. Yes. Right, which is which is ostensibly a photo archive, right? Yeah, yeah, and so, yeah. so one is going expecting one thing, and then you see this other thing that you explained exactly. was in Renee's office. Right? Exactly right. It was in Renee Musai's yeah. office. Yeah. Um, and when I went there the first time, this yeah. is the former curator there, and she said, um, "You know, I pulled out some photos for you. Mm. It came from this trunk, and the trunk was sitting next to yeah, um, this trunk. a little table. <laughs> and then she says, yeah. you know, we're not sure what to do with this trunk. We think maybe we'd throw it away.'" And I was like, "No, don't throw the trunk away. <laughs> like, you know, there's something kind of visceral, <laughs> you know, and atavistic right. that arose out of me at that moment, right? And um, mm -hmm. it's interesting because she separated 
the photos from the trunk. But when right. I approached the trunk and the photos, the first thing I started doing uh, was putting photos back in the trunk and taking photos yeah. of those photos in the trunk. Yes. Yeah. You know? So was the, was the trunk empty when you encountered it? It was empty when I encountered it because okay. like, she okay. had um, mm -hmm. taken things things yeah. out so that I could look yeah. at, you know? Yeah. And laid and them so, out but, on but, but were those photos that you photographed in the trunk in the trunk yeah. when you got there or yeah. were you? No, they were, were they were outside curating? of the trunk. I put them back okay. in the trunk. Right. They were originally right. from the trunk. Okay. Okay. Now that's, I mean, that's really interesting, but, but you know what I would love to hear about it, it, as well is a little bit more about the larger project, because this project strikes me as really, is really interesting in, in many ways and, and not the least of which being the way that you're writing mm -hmm. because you're using the second person. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, you, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. right? It's not, it's yeah. not because the, the, you know, a lot of our, you know, writing these days is I, 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 totally right. right? It's right. that sort of indeterminate right. pronoun. So I can be I, you can be I, and we can all right. be I, right. but we can also all be you. And you is a much more direct sort of invocation yeah. of your reader. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. And I would yeah. love to hear you talk about that within the larger project of this book, which is, which is historical, but also imaginary. Yes, and impressionistic. Exactly. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, you know, another excellent mm -hmm. question. So I wanted a pronoun that would arrest people, mm -hmm. you know, like arrest readers. Mm -hmm. And so it seemed to me that you would be the way to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly enough, um, my colleague and dear friend Daphne Brooks wrote a piece for Art Forum about the pronoun, partly about the pronoun you, yeah. in the moment yeah. of um, mm -hmm. the music of the Black Lives Matter. Yeah movement mm -hmm. right and she talks in that piece about you being a kind of privileged pronoun for mm -hmm. calling people into action right mm -hmm. um and it just so happened that i had landed on you as um my preferred mm -hmm. pronoun mm -hmm. for this book project but anyway the book project actually started when it wasn't when i didn't have the motif of the book Right. I wanted to do a project that would, of course, talk about Black queer art and activism, you know, during the moments of neoliberalism in mm -hmm. the UK and North America mm -hmm. um, in the 70s and 80s. And but I also wanted it to sort of illustrate the great associative imaginations of artists and mm -hmm. activists mm -hmm. um, during that period. And by that, I mean that, you know, if you're a June Jordan, for instance, you were connecting, um, you know, uh, bombings in Beirut, you know, mm -hmm. to queerness in your poetry. Yep, yep. You know, or if you're an Audre Lorde, you're talking about mm -hmm. uh, in Sister Outsider, one right. chapter, the uses of the erotic and then another yep. chapter on Grenada you know um and the end of the post-colonial violent end of the post-colonial project there you know by mm -hmm. the British who also then backed by the U.S. Mm -hmm. and so I wanted to figure out okay so how do I sort of present to people that there was something new going on in terms of the principles of association. If you think about mm -hmm. where, why Hume is useful to me, you know, if you think about uh, Hume's um, 18th century book, an, in an Inquiry into Human Understanding, right? He says that there, the mind works on three principles. One, resemblance, contiguity in time and space, and cause and effect, right? The interesting thing there is that those principles arise at the very moment that, uh, uh, Great Britain is becoming an empire, yeah. right? You know, so it's trying to sort of mm -hmm. uh, produce associations with lands and peoples that don't want to associate with it. You know, it's a, a sort right, of right. colonizing right. agents like Ireland, right? Scotland, right. Wales, right? You know, but also a contriving resemblance as a way you know, to say that you belong to us. Right, right. right? Well, it's a, it's a way of saying you were part of us, but you exactly. are, but, but you're not really part of us. Exactly, right, right, so, right, you know, right, right. You're right. part of us, but you're here. Right? Exactly, it's right, a, right. It's yeah. a kind of classic yeah. colonial yeah. gesture, right? Yeah. Yeah. But what struck me, mm -hmm. you know, with the rise really of the sort of um, anti-colonial 
-hmm. nationalisms, mm -hmm. but also later on, women of color feminism, yep. you know, queer of color work, mm -hmm. is that people were not simply beholden to those principles of no. association. No. You didn't have to resemble people in order to connect to them, right? right. right. You know, mm -hmm. um, Angela Davis has this great, um, you know, sort of understanding of women of color feminism, where she says yep. it was the moment in which, you know, um, politics would not follow mm -hmm. identity, but identity mm -hmm. would follow politics, right? So that you could mm -hmm. have these strange affinities right. between things. Right. At that, right. You know, at that moment, you're actually doing something right. other than what Hume said was mm -hmm. one of the principles of the mind, resemblance, right? right? And also right. contiguity in time and space. It does not matter if you are thousands of miles away from me, you right. know? I must figure out, you know, how to share in your narrative and your history mm -hmm. and possibly mm -hmm. your struggles, right? Right, right. So I wanted all of that to be in this book, but I mm -hmm. didn't have, it's still, it still, when I was writing it, you know, there was mm -hmm. nothing to contain it. It still seemed sure. that these associations were sure. artificial and contrived. And then one mm -hmm. day I went with a friend to the Guild Hall Gallery in London. Mm -hmm. And the gallery had an exhibition about the Black British bookstore, uh, Bogle Le Vulture, you know, which used to be in West London. Yeah. And it was started by Eric Huntley and Jessica Huntley, then yeah. two uh, Guyanese immigrants, right? Who just started a bookstore and the press from the bookstore because they wanted to put the speeches of their friend Walter Rodney together in book form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the the gallery itself reproduced the bookstore, you know. Wow. So you had shelves, wow. you had Jessica Huntley's mm -hmm. desk, you had her typewriter, mm -hmm. you had also artifacts, you know, the letters between Eric and uh Jessica, you know, in a case. You know, there was the smell of incense. It was beautiful. There was, <laughs> you know, sounds... there, there was, uh, I mean, it's like all the black bookstores yeah. you've ever been in. Like, yes, you know, yes. There was a poem, you know, in the audio that was all around you. Mm -hmm. It was really an immersive mm -hmm. experience. And then I said to my friend, I got it. This needs to be a bookshop because mm -hmm. that's the proper container for mm -hmm. all of these uh um, strange and unlikely associations, you know, mm -hmm. talking about wrote to me Fanny Coyote uh, in relation to the Biafra, uh, the war against yeah. Biafra, in relation to the mm -hmm. uh, philosophical mm -hmm. tra tradition among uh, mm -hmm. the British and particularly yes. David Hume, you know? Yes, yes. But there's, there, but what that also infers, at least in the case of, of, Fanny Coyote is that there are multiple nodes of belonging, right? Yes. And that, and that, and you say that, right? You, you, we're inventing, you know, sort of unexpected communities. I think you, right. you said it much better than that. But, um, but unexpected communities, different kinds of roots of affiliation, different right. kinds of loves, right? Um, and that, and that, that is part and parcel of this black queer experience, yeah. right? Coming coming to the UK, right. coming to the US. And, and Fanny Coyote also spent time in the US. Exactly, right. And so he, here in Washington, actually. In Georgetown, yeah. And yeah. in Georgetown. And, um, yeah. and so, you know, so he's got this sort of multiply connected tissue. Yeah. Right. And, um, and so I guess you, what, I, what I wonder, because what you've done for us today is bring a whole nother dimension into, into the life and the work. And that is the, 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 the backdrop of the Biafran War, right. which we don't talk about with him. People never talk about that. No. It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, I didn't. A million people died. Like, nobody <laughs> talks about it. No. Yeah. I mean, no one talks about it with respect to artists who weren't there in the conflict. Right. 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 And so to think about that as part of what you know, sort of what spurred, you know, Fanny Coyote's life, especially given that he was not Igbo, yeah. um, you know, is right. is right. really interesting. Right. Um, and really complicates the story in, in, in a way that that is totally unexpected. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, you know, mm -hmm. terrifically interested in, you know, mm -hmm. what are the possible ghosts yeah. 
that reside on the work. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, how do you develop a kind of um, a lens, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and a sensitivity to mm -hmm. the ghosts that must have been there. Right. Yeah. You know, you don't you're not displaced from your home because of a right. war. Right. And come out clean. And you, right. That's you not don't. what happens. You, you know? don't. Right. It's on the body. It's mm -hmm. on the work. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? and it seemed to me that part of my task was to figure out mm -hmm. you know, what are the inscriptions. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I love that. I love that. But I'm also, you know, what I'm also thinking about is, um, you know, also not just models of affiliation. Right. And models of you sort of thinking about trauma and how one deals with it, mm -hmm. either consciously or unconsciously, because I think we can make the case that a lot of that dealing in terms of the background that you so richly draw out is unconscious, mm -hmm. right? Or subconscious, as yeah. opposed to because what he always said explicitly was, okay, I'm an outsider in three ways. You know, um, I left my country. I'm I'm gay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and um Again, suddenly forgetting the third. So it was um it was familial, it was social, and it was sexual. Uh -huh. And um and it was in terms of mother country or you know, however you'd like to put that. And so he would always say, Okay, I have nothing left to lose. So this is why I do the work I do, uh -huh. which is true, uh -huh. if not glib. Uh -huh. Um but it also, but then we, it, it directed us in one direction. So, you know, you're, you're following the artist, but in ways that the artist didn't expect to be followed. Yes. Really yes. interesting. No, yeah. that's, that's right. I think that, um, you know, this is the thing, you read that essay by him, what's it called? Like ecstasy or something? <laughs> just, yeah, yeah. But it's, 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 it's beautiful, it's persuasive. Mm -hmm. And then as a reader, I had to say to myself, okay, but what's he not saying? Yeah, he doesn't give a lot up in it, actually. He doesn't give a lot up. He doesn't. And you know what? And I wrote the essay, I wrote, what, 20 years ago. Yeah. And and I didn't think of that then, mm -hmm. you know, or even with um, Ian, Ian Borland's book. Um, yeah, I didn't think about it. And thinking, oh, he's giving us so much. But yeah. then, you know, with the benefit of time and age and whatever, right. I'm like, wait a minute. Right. Actually, he gives us what he thinks we want. Exactly. Exactly. He gives us just enough to get titillated. Exactly. And then he, he, he holds a lot back. Exactly right. So, you know, you talk about like, you know, how nobody talks about the Nigerian Civil War. And there's a way in which he facilitates that silence, right? Yep. Yep. You know? yep. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, immediately I think about, um, you know, learning to read, you know, really mm -hmm. as a critical reader. Yeah. You know, in that moment of the 1980s, yes. um, yeah. when, yeah. you know, through those Black women novelists, right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so it's like Gail Jones and Corregidora, mm -hmm. or it's uh, Alice Walker and The Color mm -hmm. Purple, or Toni Morrison, Toni Morrison. Beloved, which yeah. I wrote my senior thesis in high school <laughs> on Morrison's <laughs> Beloved, right? And each yeah. one of yeah. them, you know, the theme of like the unspeakable and silence right. Um, right. is operating there. Yeah. You, know, you can also then attach that mm -hmm. to the sort of uh, emergent inquiries among mm -hmm. African-American feminist historians. So like mm -hmm. Darling Clark Hines, um, mm -hmm. Deborah Gray White, the stuff around, like, right. Right, right, right. you know, don't speak right. about that, you know, the sexual right. violence and all of that. Right. And so, I really credit them with um, producing, you know, a kind of ear in me as a reader for like what's not being said here, mm. Mm. and how is the unsaid also the evidence of right. you know historical violence, you know, right. trauma. Right. But it, it seems to me that that that's the sort of thing you're trying to get to mm -hmm. too in mm -hmm. in the not just how the the dots you're connecting but also in the way that you're writing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because if we're yes. doing a straightforward narrative, yes. you yes. know, that gets tough. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because like this, I haven't really written like this as a scholar, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, before. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. where it is a sort of interplay of, um, 
you know, the critical and the imaginative. Is it nerve wracking? Say again? Is it nerve wracking? I don't know if it's nerve wracking because um, for me, uh, it, you know, it's kind of where I started as like, you know, okay. that teenager who wanted mm -hmm. to be a writer and a poet, mm -hmm. you know? So it's oddly mm -hmm. enough taking me back to- to Return to form. Yeah, to a kind of mm -hmm. old landmark, mm -hmm. right? But it's uh, challenging in the sense of, uh, I remember when I first uh, wrote something in this vein from the mm -hmm. bookshop, I had to do like the Eve Cedric lecture at uh, Boston University. Mm -hmm. And I was staying with a friend and I was just trying to get the language right, trying to get the language right. And then my friend left for uh, to teach at like say nine o'clock and I was in this chair in her dining room working on it. She came back around four o'clock and I was in the same chair, <laughs> 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 you know, trying to get the language right because, yeah. um, mm -hmm. you know, it had to be, you know, one of the mm -hmm. things where the seams wouldn't show, okay? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the part where it slips from being historical and critical mm -hmm. to make believe like that couldn't show you know this is pretty seamless thank you <laughs> this is seamless i mean suddenly we are waiting and and i had you know for for our participants i had the 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 privilege of having the text already so i kind of knew but um but even as a reader right you 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 it almost imperceptibly switch from this sort of imp impressionistic imaginative um space of a bookstore mm -hmm. right and you're describing, and then you go, you start describing that trunk, and it's a beautiful description. And then suddenly you're talking about Nigerian history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not even their lives. You just start talking about Nigerian history. And I was like, yeah. oh, 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 oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You find yourself in this other place. You find yourself in this other place, but then you come back. Then you come back, right, totally right. And it's almost the experience of being in a bookstore and opening a book. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. <laughs> and so, you know, oh, okay, I'm in, I'm in this space. And, yeah. Oh, here's, here's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the wonderful quality. Like, the book. oh, now I'm out, now I'm in this aisle looking at this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and, and, and how we go through, because we don't go through saying, okay, I just want, you know, or, or for me, you know, I, I don't want just the art book. You right. know, oh, here's something else. So here's Hume. Oh, here's, and that's, right. yeah, so right. it's it's a kind of rhizomatic. Right. So right. movement through. And I think that, yes. that you approach this in this text. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. You know, I remember um, going on this, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of one of those kind of archaeological tours mm -hmm. by this Black British guy named Dada. And Dada, through a friend, gave me and another friend a tour of I want to say, was it Drum and Spear? I can't remember the, the name of that. It wasn't Bogle de Vulture. It was another Black mm -hmm. bookshop. Mm -hmm. And he gave us a tour of um, basically the Notting Hill neighborhood, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and what was there when the that bookshop was yeah. in existence, right? Yeah. And then he started recounting, mm -hmm. you know, some of the texts that were there mm -hmm. and, you know, things that you would expect, you know, the sort of Walter Rodney, the Rosa mm -hmm. Gee, but then he also said, you know, and we also made sure we had a copy of something, I don't know, like, you know, something from Ovid, or like, <laughs> you know. Because that's what we do, right? Exactly, right, exactly, <laughs> that's what we right, do. <laughs> right, 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 right. And it also just reminded me yeah. of mm -hmm. when I was a student mm -hmm. at Howard and in my classical social theory mm -hmm. course mm -hmm. as an undergraduate, um, you know, we of course read, you know, the Scottish moral philosophers, right? right? Um, right. And also the first time I ever read um, Feuerbach was in that class. But then right. we also read, you know, writings about Ibn Khaldun, you know? Exactly, exactly. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, sort of Martin Bernal's Black mm -hmm. Athena, mm -hmm. you know? So there was a real mm -hmm. sense that if you were going to know you know, the, mm -hmm. the vast histories of Black social formations, right. you also needed to know the sort of foundations in antiquity, but also, yep. um, you know, the sort of yep. uh, European writings as right. well. 
Right. And they weren't understood to be contradictions. It's sort of like, well, exactly. You know how, you, how you got to be yeah. a bastard yeah. by looking at these right. texts. Like, <laughs> right, right. And 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 they're never thought of as being antithetical. They only right. become antithetical in 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 an academic context right. exactly. where we've right. got black studies over here and totally everything right. else over here. Right. Which doesn't reflect what we all do. Totally and it right. doesn't reflect how these artists were working. Right. Right. It doesn't exactly. reflect it. It's not, right. it, you know. They read. Right. 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 <laughs> Fanny right. Cotty read. He he exactly you know, right. He, exactly he, right. He worked you with know. other people, and there was that whole scene that yeah. he was a part of. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and not for I mean, what is sort of mind-boggling is how brief that period was, really. Yes. Because That's he right. died so young, right? That's and right. Alex died young. And That's um right. That's and right. um, you know, but it was yeah, it was really, it could not have been more than about 10, 15 years. And the work work, and what we think of as the work work, okay. is less than 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We well, know this is also the, the point of the, you know, what motivated me to, mm -hmm. uh, to do this project is that, you know, I wanted to figure out, okay, so how do we talk about something like neoliberalism, mm. which can be just the context for verifying incapacity all the time, right? You know, there's nothing we can do. It's just neoliberalism. It's just how it is. Yeah, yeah. And so I wanted to return to those moments where things were just really, really bad socially and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the 1980s you know? yeah, yeah. It just they were bad socially politically oh, especially in britain especially in britain in the mess. u.s and yeah. Yeah. but they were also exciting times right in the sense that people did not let go of work even when they were sick yeah. well, that's extraordinary yeah, it's true. you have that film that marlon riggs did black is black ain't yeah. giving direction yep. on his sick bed yep yeah. You know, so what? What and Essex Hemphill was doing it with his poetry, and exactly you know, right. And our exactly. Team, Fanny Coyote was doing exactly. it with his work. Exactly. Um, what yeah. allowed them to yeah. do that? You know, yeah. Audre Lorde writing the cancer journals. Yeah. You know, when things are really, really bad around you, like how yeah. do you mobilize? You know, internal and communal resources right. to get something done. Yeah. You know, and it's different for different people. It's right? different and for it's, different, you know, different for different yeah. people. Yeah, but you, your, your point is is so is so on point. Um, where in in these spaces, and you know, and frankly, I'm old enough to have been there. <laughs> so, um, and you know, people just did what they did, and some did it to live. Yeah, some did it because they were on borrowed time, and they're like, I got to get this stuff done. I'm yeah, not be here very long. Yeah, that's right. And there are other people who thought they weren't going to be here very long and are still with us. Right. And so I mean it's it's all of there's all of this stuff. Yeah, it's very staggered. You know? That that happens at the, you know in the in these years. Right. In the UK, in the US, in so many other places. Um, and you know, and how and its effect on on black queer cultural workers, yeah. writers, yeah. artists, yeah, performers. Absolutely directors the whole plot yeah. it, there is you don't even like leaving a war it's it's a war it's right a war. Yeah. and the way it was treated politically it was a war yeah, yeah and you don't come out of it not changed yeah no absolutely. you have to do the work or you have yeah. to do this or some people didn't some people didn't yeah, some people didn't yeah right yeah, and yeah. so i mean that's the thing i remember walking into that exhibition on the 80s and mm. art this will have been yeah and you know, I went into one of the rooms, and I can't remember who the artist was, but it was like a montage of just like yeah. constantly yeah. rotating uh, photographs, yeah. you know, yeah. of people at parties, mm -hmm. people after sex, you know, people right before sex, you know, people hanging mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. um, you know, people homeless. And I remember mm -hmm. walking out of that, and I was like, I really miss the fucked up eighties, like you know. So <laughs> and I, okay, not to just you know, not to like go loose too much, but I was at Yale at that moment. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, yeah. In the yeah. early eighties, yeah, it was fucked up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And at the and same time, yeah. yeah, people were aggressively living their lives. Exactly. Exactly. You know, so, aggressively living mm -hmm, their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's inspiring. Yeah. And it was beautiful. Yeah, exactly. and it's still beautiful today. I don't. I don't want to get all today. sort of nostalgic. Like that was great, and this is crap. It's, it's yeah, not. No, that. totally right. People still do right. it. I mean, you know, people still do it. 
Yeah. And so, but um, but we have a few minutes left. We have two questions. Okay, and if sure. anyone else wants to throw a question, is please do so. Um, one is from an anonymous attendee who at, you know, basically asks about Maplethorpe. And he's, mm -hmm. he says, apparently, Robert Maplethorpe died the same year as Fanny Coyote in 89, which is true. Did the two photographers know each other? Did their interest in depicting homoeroticism through photography influence each other's work and artistic practice? You know, I feel like I should sort of cede that one to you. Um, sure, I can talk about it, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. like yeah, I mean, you can see the resonances and but also the oh yeah, no, there is, the two, there but I don't know of like yeah, a formal relationship between the yeah. two. I, as far as I know, they did not know each other, and I don't know if Maplethorpe was a, aware of Fanny Coyote. Fanny Coyote was absolutely aware of Maple. Yeah, exactly. And, right. um, yeah. and and has admitted that he knows the work and has, you know, and and you know, Maplethorpe's notes in the margin, no, uh, the black book came right. out in 1986. Right. And so Fanny Coyote would have seen it. He might well have had a copy mm -hmm. of it. I don't know. But um, but that the 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 black figures, which are super complicated. Yeah. Um, they everyone was seeing them. Everybody was seeing them. Yeah. And so yeah, I remember seeing them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so and we were they, they, uh, so many of our responses to the that work was contradictory. Yeah, yeah. We loved them and hated them. And yeah, so, you know it's interesting. Yeah. Um, if you think about like, I didn't show them, but wrote to me. Well, I, I guess the last one wrote to me Fanny Coyote's nudes, right? Yeah. And all the work that they do. Yep, they do a lot of work. They do a lot of work, like, mm -hmm. you know, the Mary Poppins, there's a sort of reference to popular culture, but yep. also to Victorian history, and then the sort of disruptions mm -hmm. of Victorian history. In other photos, uh, mm -hmm. especially the one where you have the Yarba priest and, mm -hmm. you know, a naked guy giving mm -hmm. a fellatio. Right, right, robe, right. You know, um, you know, they're doing a lot of work in, in their worldliness. Mm -hmm. and their historicity right. Right. you know that I have always appreciated and in many ways mm -hmm. marked as a difference right uh, right is difference from other folks so. yeah yeah and so um okay we got two other questions here one is more yeah okay one from uh Lucia Obumi Momo building off of my comment about about Fanny Coyote's Yoruba heritage. Um, I wonder if a reason for his family's migration was their potentially unpopular political position in relation to the Biafran War, and if this form of dissent, migration, and opposition to post-colonial priorities is also what you're arguing is part of, his, of Fanny Coyote's work. All right, and then I think she added some, just to clarify, Dr. Nelson. Yeah, yeah, that's oh, okay. that's right, you can see this too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, you know, possibly. Uh, if uh, you speak to uh, the colleague in the chat, if you know of um, any writings or interviews uh, mm. by with the family in which they talk about that, I would love for you to share those. Right, right. You know, because the family was was very high up. In, very in high terms up. Of, in terms right. Of position very high that. up. I mean, yeah. you know, he also. Yeah. I mean, you know, one way is to say possibly. Yeah. Um, but it would require more than what I have right now. So more, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Because there is the argument that they could have just gone to Yoruba land. Exactly right. right. Yeah, 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 so. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I like to think, or I suspect mm -hmm. that um, if that was the case, then that you know, you know, help to. Mm -hmm. Uh, become a resource for his own queerness, you know, in the yeah. sense of like the, uh, uh, yeah. say like the family's uh, mm -hmm. objection to or siding with, mm -hmm. you know, the Nigerian government. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's that part where he says, I was meant to be, I was supposed to be mm -hmm. a respectable economist or something, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. And he talks about that. He's like, you know, I was supposed to, he doesn't, he's not specific, but he's like, I'm supposed to be, you know, not this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah <laughs> so yeah. I'm supposed to know. be the sort of, yeah. you know, good mm -hmm. professional. Right. Respectable one. Right. 
and I decided to become an artist and, 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 I'm queer. and also be queer. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> you know, so I would like to explore exactly what you're getting at, mm. um, Lucia. Um, I need more resources for it. Yeah. But uh, where I would like to, I would like to explore the relationship, possible relationship between his mm-hmm. his articulation of queerness, right, and um, maybe a sort of departure from you know sort of Oedipal. Yes. Real. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's really interesting. It's a great question. Thank you, Lucia. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah. So we have time for one more question. And we only have one more question, so we're good. Um, and this is from Alex Vialho, and he's thanking you for your evocative talk. Can you speak more to any sense you have of the trunk in Fanny Cardi's lifetime beyond the coffee table rumor and metaphoric or material readings of that context? Were the pictures located stored there while he was living, or did Hearst use it as a site of storage after his passing? That's a great question. Yeah. Very moved by the animating idea of the storage trunk energizing his histories. And he notes another comment in with respect to an AIDS-related context. Might the trunk evoke a coffin or a political funeral? Wait, what was that last part? I didn't get that part. Um, basically, was it all? Do you also think it might evoke a, a coffin or a political funeral, considering the moment in which it's? You know, it's an interesting question. I need to do more mm-hmm. asking, uh, interviewing with Renee Musai and with Mark yeah. Seeley. Yeah. yeah, because they're the ones who sort of hold that story. Um, mm-hmm. I think Mark said that Mark, uh, the director of autographs, said, yep. he said, "I remember when he brought that trunk." <laughs> right, right. Well, they all knew I, him. They all knew they him. Got, they all knew him. They all knew him. Yeah, that's right. They, they all they knew him. All so I need to friends. just yeah. do more yeah. um, asking around yeah. about it, and in terms of like what were all the uses of the trunk at the same right. time, um, you know, thinking here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but it of... also kind of works against your book. <laughs> you know, yeah. Part of that is, it, you know, you're what you're not trying to do in a way. Yeah, exactly. Sort of figure out the, you know, the material properties and material history of that trunk. The oh, trunk yeah. is a device for you. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. To... Yeah, and, you know, I also don't want to know too much. Yeah, you know? because it'll, it'll mess up your story. <laughs> exactly. And also, like, I, want, I need to, li- mm-hmm. this is where I learn a lot from mm-hmm. Toni Morris. You know, I remember when I was watching this interview of her mm-hmm. talking about Beloved and the making of Beloved and the story of Margaret Garner. And she says, at a certain point, I stopped reading because I didn't want to know so much that it wouldn't allow me room to create. And yeah. it wouldn't allow the reader yeah. room to create. Like, you've got to kind of leave some gaps. Yeah, yeah. No, I feel that way about some of the work I'm doing. Yeah, you, know, mm-hmm. you stop reading and you start writing, um, and 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 there are other people who can do the kind of sort of meticulous. Right. And not yeah. that your work is not meticulous, but the kind of work that so yeah. many people want. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I am afraid that we are at time. There are a couple of other questions here that we that came in at the last minute that that we can make sure that Roderick gets. That would be great. So um, so yeah. I'm assuming that Jane can send you a list great. of the questions. Yeah. And um, I want to thank you all again for being here with us. I also want to thank Roderick for a really wonderful paper and a wonderful conversation. No, and thank you, Stephen, for you know and such so, a great yeah. uh, exchange. Great. So everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Take good care. Take good care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.